everyone. Thanks for stopping by for this week's Bible study. Our Bible study this week, it is the Bible study of the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. It is an important one. I want to thank all of you for stopping by to either listen to the Bible study or to watch it on YouTube as well. I hope all of you enjoy this study. Get comfortable. Pull out your Bibles. Let's dig deep into some scripture. The transfiguration of Jesus is one of the most significant occurrences in scripture, but it is often overlooked. In this study, we take a deep dive into the past of mankind and we will see the future of mankind being represented in the transfiguration of Jesus. Today for this study, I'm going to reference both Mark and Matthew's gospel uh, when we talk about the transfiguration of Jesus. Now, to get us to the transfiguration of Jesus, I want to I want to lead us up to the transfiguration of Jesus. I want to speak about uh, what Jesus had been doing prior, a uh, question that he had asked the disciples that essentially set up the transfiguration for us. Now, of course, we know prior to the transfiguration, uh, we know that Jesus, his ministry, it had began. It began with Jesus uh, being baptized. We saw this in a recent Sunday school lesson that we had. Uh, and it also began Jesus's ministry. Uh, it began after he had went out into the wilderness of Judea and he had fasted for 40 days or 40 nights. And then he was tempted by Satan. So prior to the transfiguration of Jesus, we know that Jesus, his ministry, uh, it had began. Jesus had been teaching uh, he had been performing many miracles. Uh, the name of Jesus, I would say to all of you, it was well known. But the identity to who Jesus was, was not really known by the people. And dare I say, uh, it was barely even known by the disciples. The disciples, they just knew Jesus as he was. They didn't understand uh, the divinity of Jesus. And again, that's something that the people uh, certainly did not know. So scripture we'll see tell us here uh, in Mars gospel. If you go over to the eighth chapter, uh, you'll see where scripture tells us that Jesus had came to the region of Philippi, Caesarea, uh, which if you look at a map of Israel, you see uh, that uh, this location is essentially north uh, the Sea of Galilee, or if you you may be looking at a map that may say Tiberias, that's the same as the Sea of Galilee. Uh, this location was in northern Israel. And at this location in the 8th chapter of Mark's gospel and the 27th verse, we'll see where Jesus, he asked the disciples, who do the people, who do men say that I am? And we find that the disciples when they spoke to Jesus about who the people were saying Jesus was, we find that the people did not know Jesus's true identity. Uh, we'll see there in scripture uh, that the people were saying that Jesus was essentially either a prophet. He may have been John the Baptist. He may have been Elijah as well. Okay, we see that there uh, in the 28th verse. Again, we find that in scripture, in the gospels, by this point in time, that Jesus had been performing miracles, that Jesus had been teaching uh, in the gospels. If you just go back a couple of chapters here in, in Mark's gospel, uh, you'll see where in the sixth chapter of Mark's gospel that Jesus had just fed 4,000 with a few pieces of fish and a few pieces of bread. This was the second time that Jesus had fed a great multitude with just having a few pieces of fish and a few pieces of bread. All of us, we know the telling of Jesus feeding the 5,000. We know that very well. But scripture actually shows us where Jesus fed 5,000 and then he fed 4,000. Two separate occasions where he had fed a multitude with just a few pieces of fish and a few pieces of bread. We also know that by this point in time, again, that Jesus, he had been a miracle worker, right? Uh, he had performed the miracle where he turned water into wine. We all know that telling very well. But 
at this point in time, for example, if you take a look at the 15th chapter of Matthew's gospel, you'll see where Jesus had healed a great multitude, a multitude of people who had all sorts of disabilities, those that were lame, those that were blind, those that were mute, those that were maimed. Jesus did this just prior to asking the disciples, who do people say that I am? And the people, they had concluded that Jesus was a miracle worker. They had concluded that Jesus was someone that had been sent from the Lord. Now, the people's thought on who Jesus was, it ran contrary to who the religious leaders believed Jesus were. The religious leaders, believe it or not, they believed that the works that Jesus had performed, the miracles, and even his teaching, even though Jesus was teaching about the Lord, right? Even though he was uh, teaching about uh, turning to God, repentance, teaching that God loved them and would forgive them of their sin, right? The religious leaders, they had this thought that the works that Jesus did, he did by Beelzebub which was another name of Satan, which was another name of the devil. So they believed that the miracles that Jesus performed and his teaching, they believed that it was the works of the devil, which certainly does not make any sense. So just to be clear here, the identity of Jesus, according to the people, and even by the religious leaders, it had nothing to do with Jesus being the only begotten son of God. So the true identity of Jesus was not something that was recognized by uh, the people of Israel or by that point in time, it was just the Jews, those who were of, in Jerusalem and those in the land of Judea. They didn't know the true identity of Jesus and the religious leaders. They certainly, they were far away from understanding the true identity of as to who Jesus was. We, of course, because we have studied and, you know, we have been in church all of our lives, right? We, we know that Jesus is the only begotten son of God. We know that while Jesus was, is, is man, right? He, he, he's in the flesh. He's flesh and blood at that time. We know that he is, that he's the only begotten son of God. And by being the only begotten son of God, we know that while he's in the flesh, He's still both holy and divine. So with that thought in mind, we, we will find that Jesus then turned and he asked the disciples there. And again, you can find this in both Mark and in Matthew's gospel where Jesus, he asked his closest disciples. OK, he asked his closest followers, the 12. He asked them, well, who do you say that I am? OK, the people are are saying that I may be John the Baptist. The people are saying that I may be Elijah or some other prophet. Well, you've been with me this whole time. That's essentially what Jesus is asking the disciples. You, you've been with me the whole time. Well, who do you say I am? Who do you think I am? And we'll find there that Peter, he responded, he answered, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. That is what Peter's response was. And to this response, Jesus said to him that you didn't come up with this response by your own wisdom. You, you don't you don't you don't have the smarts by your by your own wisdom to be able to come up with that answer. And so Jesus, he said to Peter, OK, uh, you you said, well, right. And you were led to this answer. You were given this answer by the Father. You was given this answer through the Holy Spirit. Okay. So Peter's answer, again, is a very interesting answer. Uh, because, again, he did not come to the answer by his own wisdom. None of us can actually come to know Jesus uh, by our own wisdom. And, and what I mean by that is that we can't do it on our own. We need assistance we need help. And I'm not saying that we need assistance, that we need help in doing so by by man. We need the assistance and we need the help of God 
to know and to understand who exactly he is. OK, and this follows in line with what Peter or I'm sorry, what Paul, what he said to the Corinthians in the 12th chapter of first Corinthians. And in the third verse, we'll see where Paul said to the Corinthians that no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. OK, we, we have to remember the the role that the Holy Spirit plays in our life. Right. The role that the Holy Spirit plays in our life is to lead us unto all truth. Jesus said to the disciples that uh, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And we know the Holy Spirit plays a role in our life as the helper. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. That's what Jesus said in scripture. He helps us. He guides us on our journey when we need to remember what the Lord has said to us the Holy Spirit will call to our remembrance all that the Lord has shown us, all that the Lord has taught us, all that the Lord has has said to us. The Holy Spirit calls those things to our remembrance. And again, the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us unto all truth. So when when we are choosing between right and wrong, the Holy Spirit is there to guide us in making the decision between right and wrong. OK, some of us, we often describe it as a voice in our head that is telling us what not to do and what to do. We can some of us say we, we get a feeling and I often warn about those feelings that we can get because the devil can play with our feelings as well. But we, we often say that we get a feeling going on when we are doing something that may be wrong and when we are doing something that may be right. But again, the Holy Spirit guides us unto all truth and the truth that the Holy Spirit guides us unto when we are unknowing of his way is the Lord's way. The Holy Spirit revealed to us the Lord and the Holy Spirit, by revealing the Lord unto us, led us into accepting him. OK, there is no one, as Paul said, that can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. I can't say that to you today uh, without having the Holy Spirit, without having had the Holy Spirit lead me unto that truth. OK, so the truth that I believe today is the truth that the Holy Spirit, that's the third person of God, right? We have God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. I was led to that truth by the Lord through the Holy Spirit. So for Peter, it's honestly a very interesting thought for him to have been led to this answer by the Holy Spirit, because we wouldn't have thought that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit uh, was with Peter at that point in time. Because, again, we know from what we have studied in Scripture before that the disciples, they did not actually receive the Holy Spirit until the until uh, Jesus had died and was resurrected uh, until Jesus had went away when he ascended back. We know that the disciples, they received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, which was a distance away from where we are at this point in time in our scripture today. But what we do see here is the influence of the Holy Spirit. Even though the Holy Spirit was not dwelling with Peter at that moment in time, we find that the Holy Spirit was at work. Uh, we, we see the influence of the Holy Spirit, and that's something that I can point out. Uh, as well, because there are many people who believe that the Holy Spirit was not at work until after Jesus ascended back to heaven from this world. And that's not the truth. We know that the Holy Spirit has been at work all of the time, uh, even since before creation. Again, we know this because the Holy Spirit is God, right? And, 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 and God is everlasting. He's eternal. And all three parts are, again, all three persons, I should say, have always been at work. That's what Jesus has said. And so the Holy Spirit, you find him at work in the Old Testament, even though many people believe that the Holy Spirit was not at work in the Old Testament. We find where the Holy Spirit was at work at the creation. Uh, even David spoke of the, the essentially the Holy Spirit uh, being with him uh, when he spoke about the joy of his salvation and being in fellowship uh, with the Lord as well. We find the Holy Spirit was always at work. And again, the Holy Spirit was always at work by influencing. Okay. And we see that influence here uh, with Peter as well, where the Holy Spirit influenced him uh, in leading him to the truth and then answering Jesus's question with the truth. So 
again, Jesus, he was curious as to who the people were saying that he was. And, and then he wanted to hear who the disciples said that he was as well. And we find here with the transfiguration of Jesus, we find where he was essentially revealing his identity to the disciples. So as we continue to look at the eighth chapter there, and we take a look at the 31st verse, we'll see that Jesus, he predicts here his suffering. He predicts his rejection by the religious leaders. And he then predicts his death and his re resurrection to the disciples. Jesus, he will then see there in the 34th verse, he called on the people and then he called on his disciples as well to, to, to come unto him. And he said that whoever desires to come after him, to, in other words, follow him, he said that they should deny themselves and that they should take up their cross and to follow him. Okay. And again, if you are going to, if you, if you proclaim to be a believer in Christ, and again, if you genuinely believe in him, you have to put God first. And, and again, this is, I'm not going to dive too deep into this subject, but this is something that I recently spoke about at church uh, this past Sunday during the Sunday school lesson. And I don't think that this came up when I recorded and when I did the video of uh, the Sunday school lesson about the temptation uh, of Jesus. But something that many of us as believers, we struggle with is putting God first in our lives. And this has nothing to do with the transfiguration really of Jesus, but just to touch on it. In order for us to, to put the Lord first in our life, we have to deny ourselves, which, which means that we're going to have our wants, right? And we, many of us are going to want to live in our in our own way. We want to go our own way, if that makes any sense to you. But for the believer to put God first, we have to put aside the, that way. We have to put aside that mindset. We have to, in other words, put aside our me first mindset. And our mindset should be guided by the Lord to where our thoughts and our actions are Christ first thoughts and Christ first actions to where we are being led by the Holy Spirit. And when I say Christ way thoughts, and when I say Christ way actions first, I'm not talking about the first thing that you do when you wake up in the day is, is read scripture or pray to the Lord. If you do that, that's fine, but that's not necessarily putting God first in your life. The manner in which you live, if your thoughts and if your actions are guided by the Lord, if you are doing your best to live obedient to his way, then you are putting God first. OK, so Jesus, he, he had this conversation. He was having this conversation prior to his transfiguration. And again, this was a conversation uh, that dealt with uh, his identity. But again, we'll see there just taking a look at the 31st through the 38th verse there. We see that this this conversation be, uh, became a conversation about one's faith. If you're going to genuinely believe in Christ and the Lord, then you have to put God first in your life. And so when we turn over to the ninth chapter of Mark's gospel and we look at the first verse, uh, we'll see that that Jesus, he said, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. OK, so we we go from the identity of Jesus, knowing who exactly Jesus is, right? Knowing his true identity, knowing that Jesus is holy and he is divine to the the subject of faith, which, again, if your faith is genuine, then you know that Jesus, while in the flesh, is holy and divine. Something that John wrote about uh, in his first epistle is the fact that uh, those who deny Christ, who deny that he was in the flesh, uh, they are of the spirit of Antichrist, the Antichrist, who uh, will in the future 
proclaim to be Christ and proclaim to be Christ by doing works that we would say are of God, but the whole time, uh, the works that he would do would be in denial of Christ and uh, it will lead the world astray from from the Lord. Whereas all of those who are of faith uh, believe that Christ came in the flesh and essentially gave his life for us. So we essentially see here where, where Jesus is speaking on that. He spoke about his identity, okay, he spoke about himself. Yes, he was man in flesh, but he's holy and divine. Uh, then he followed that up about faith. Okay. We must have faith in him. Okay. And then he talked about, he spoke about, he predicted, right, his death and his resurrection, which again is our faith. We, our faith, the foundation of our faith, right, is to believe that, that the Lord was born in the flesh. Okay. That he manifested himself in the world, in the flesh, uh, through his only begotten son, right? who gave his life for us. He died and then he rose again on the third day. So we find Jesus talking about what are the pillars, the foundation of our faith. Okay. And here in the ninth chapter in the first verse, he begins to speak about the kingdom of God, which again, we say, and we have seen in scripture has been promised to all of those who genuinely believe in the Lord. So, so he says here in the first verse, okay, he said again that I say to you that there are some standing here. So in this statement from Christ, I want you to understand that he was not talking about necessarily a future time, okay, with that statement there in the first verse, where again, he said that there are some standing here who will not taste death till or until they see the kingdom of God. So some that were present there, that were standing there with Jesus, is what Jesus is saying there. They would not taste death until they saw the kingdom of God present with power. Okay. Now, I would have to imagine that those who were standing there, and it wasn't just the disciples that were standing there at that point in time, because Jesus, again, as I had stated there uh, in the 31st verse of the 8th chapter, uh, and then going through the 38 verse, we saw where he had called the people unto himself along with the disciples. So there were his disciples that were standing there and there were people uh, that were standing there as well. Who were disciples, I should say, as well. They were following uh, Jesus as well, but they weren't his closest disciples. Uh, he's saying that there were some of them that were standing there with him who would literally see, they would see Okay, the kingdom of God present with power. All right. So when we begin to move forward here in our study, we're going to see exactly what this meant through the transfiguration of Jesus. All right. We're told here in the second verse, as we continue on, that uh, six days had passed. And in, in Luke's gospel, uh, because he counted the days, he was counting uh, from a different day anyway. Uh, he he. He said that it was eight days, but Luke and Matthew and Mark, they both was essentially speaking about the same period of time. OK, uh, Mark, he says here, and Matthew said in his gospel that there were six days that had went by according to the date that they were counting from uh, to where Jesus, he took with him Peter, James and John up on uh, the mountain. We're told that they went high uh, into the mountain. And we are told here in scripture that Jesus, he transfigured, he transfigured himself, the transfiguration, uh, it took place. Now, uh, it's interesting that we see him take Peter, James, and John here, uh, to, to the transfiguration, right? Uh, Peter, James, and John, they also, uh, later on in scripture, when Jesus went into the garden to pray before he was arrested, uh, Jesus took them uh, with him into the garden. So it's interesting that Jesus, he took these three on uh, two separate occasions to two important events uh, that we find in scripture. And some of us may be wondering, well, why did Jesus take Peter, James, and John? What was so special about them? Uh, one of my favorite commentators actually <laughs> Uh, commented that Jesus took these three because they were the weakest of uh, the disciples. Now, whether I agree with that or not, uh, I, I'm not too certain about that. I don't know if I would say that myself. Uh, but 
for myself, I, I look at who these three were, right? Uh, Peter, he had just said that Jesus was the son of the living God. And when Peter had said that, uh, Jesus had said to him, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build my church upon you. That's that's what Jesus had said to Peter. Uh, John was the beloved disciple, uh, the disciple who Jesus loved. He, he, Jesus and John, they were, I would say, close friends. Okay. Um, and in John's gospel, when you look at uh, the 21st chapter of John's gospel, uh, which essentially is the, the, the ending of John's gospel, uh, we see where Jesus said out of all of the disciples that John was going to live the longest and uh, that John would see some things. And, and again, we know uh, John, he not only wrote uh, the three epistles of his, he not only wrote his gospel, but he wrote the book of Revelation as well. Okay, so uh, John and Peter, we see our two special disciples, right? And then James was the brother of John, and James, he would be one of the first uh, of the the apostles who were martyred. Uh, both James and John, we find in scripture, uh, that they both desire to sit at the right or the left hand of Jesus. Okay, so that's in my mindset why Jesus took these three with uh, him to the transfiguration and why he took them with him deeper into the garden when he uh, prayed in the garden prior to his arrest. They were, I believe, special disciples. Peter was seen as the the de facto leader of the disciples because he was the oldest of the disciples. And again, uh, James and John, they were brothers. And, and again, they, they had a, a type of faith about them. Uh, to where I believe that Jesus took him or took them with him on on both of these occasions, right? So they go up into the mountain, uh, these three disciples with Jesus. The other disciples that remained, uh, they were remained at the base of the mountain. And in Mark's gospel here in the 19th chapter, uh, when you start at the 14th verse, if you look at the 14th verse, uh, you'll see where they were dealing with an issue themselves and they were dealing with a demon possessed boy uh, who scripture tells us that the, the remaining disciples, they were unable to to heal uh, the demon possessed boy. They they were unable to cast that uh, spirit out of uh, the the boy himself. And, and Jesus, after the transfiguration, he came out of the mountain uh, to deal with what those disciples were were unable to deal with. We're not going to jump into that because that doesn't really play a part in our study for uh, this week. So back here, uh, looking again at the second verse, uh, we're told here that Jesus was transfigured uh, before the disciples. Now, uh, transfigure uh, is a change in form or appearance. It is a metamorphosis and exalting or in a glorifying is what uh, the definition, uh, what the dictionary defines uh, transfiguration or to transfigure uh, what it means. In Luke's gospel, we are told that uh, Jesus, when, when he and the three disciples here, when they went up into the mountain, we're told that Jesus, he began to pray. So let's try to, to picture this for a moment. Right. Jesus and these three disciples, they have gone high into the mountain and Jesus, as they go high into the mountain, he he began to pray in the mountain. And you can imagine that as Jesus was praying in the mountain, that his appearance, it uh, it began to change. OK, uh, we, we are told that as he prayed, that his his face shone like the sun, according to Matthew's gospel. And then all three of the synoptic gospels uh, tell us that even Jesus' clothes uh, changed as well as the transfiguration uh, began to take place. All three of the gospels tells us that his clothes uh, became white as snow or white as light. So Luke's gospel uh, will say that that Jesus's clothes, when when they changed, uh, that they were glistening. Uh, he was he was glowing. There was a sparkle 
about his his glow. OK, so this is the transfiguration. All right. Jesus, his appearance, the his normal appearance, we would say it, it began to shine bright. All right. Now, something that I do want to make a note here about Jesus's appearance here at the transfiguration is that the description of Jesus that we're seeing here, where his face shined like the sun, according to Matthew's gospel, right? And we're told that his clothes were white as snow. The description of Jesus's image is very similar to the image of the certain man that is described to us in the 10th chapter of Daniel. All right, you'll find that in the sixth verse. The description of Jesus's image at the transfiguration uh, is somewhat similar to the resurrected body of Jesus as well, though uh, at the, the resurrected body. And we're going to take a look at this in a moment as well. The resurrected body of Jesus, we we're not told it shined like uh, a bright light. However, when we go over into the book of Revelation, and when we look at the first chapter of Revelation and you look at the 14th and the 15th verse, we'll find that the image of Jesus during the transfiguration is very similar to the description of the son post incarnate, right? The post resurrected body of Jesus, though the image of Jesus in the book of Revelation, OK, is him in heaven in all of his glory, right? And, and we're, we're, we're again, you'll, you'll see that in the first chapter of Revelation, the 14th and the 15th verse. So something that I want to note about the transfiguration of Jesus is that uh, it is an image, right? It is an image of his future self. OK, when he's in glory. So I, I would say to you that the transfiguration of Jesus was a picture of the kingdom of God. Now, what did we just say? OK, what did we just see Jesus say what he had just promised there? Right. Jesus had promised that there were some who were standing present with him who would not taste death until they saw the kingdom of God present in power. So we find that the transfiguration of Jesus was just that. It was the fulfilling of what Jesus had just promised to the disciples and the people that were standing there with Jesus. All right. James, John and Peter. They were able to witness, to get a glimpse of the kingdom of God. All right. And that, this is something that, that Peter would go on to write about uh, in, in his letter to where Peter was said in his letter that uh, the thing that he and the apostles wrote about and that they spoke about, that they preached about, that they taught about was not a fable. It was not something that they made up, but that they were eyewitnesses to the majesty of. All right. Of Jesus Christ. They were eyewitnesses to the kingdom of God because he, John and James, right? They stood and they saw the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain. All right. Now, as we continue on here in Mars gospel, uh, we can look further into this picture of the kingdom of God, right? As Jesus was transfigured, Scripture tells us that Elijah and Moses appeared there and scripture tells us that they talked with Jesus during the transfiguration. All right. Moses and Elijah, we are told here in the, in scripture that they appeared in glory. All right. And they spoke to Jesus about his upcoming death. All right. And the death that they spoke of was Jesus's physical death. So, Essentially, uh, they spoke about the death that Jesus would suffer on the cross. And we are told here that as they talked, that a cloud came and it overshadowed them. And then a voice, we are told, came out of the cloud and said, this is my beloved son, hear him. 
So all of this, again, we're, we're seeing this, this image of heaven. We're seeing this, this picture of the kingdom of God, where Jesus, Elijah, and Moses, they are standing in glory, right? And then we see this, 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 this cloud come, and then out of the cloud, there's this voice essentially of the Father. There's the voice of God the Father saying, this is my beloved son. That's how we know that this is the voice of God the Father, okay? Uh, and, and again, what we are seeing here, all right, is the kingdom of God, and we're, we're seeing this cloud that we have seen once before in Scripture as well, all right? Uh, this cloud is the Shekinah cloud. It is the cloud of glory, which again signifies that the presence of the Lord. We have seen this cloud before when when Moses went up on Mount Sinai. All right, this scripture is covered in the twenty fourth chapter of the book of Exodus. If you if you want to turn there for a moment, and of course I'll bring it up on the screen here for all of you who may be looking at the video. All right. So for all of you who are not looking at the video, turn over to the 24th chapter of Exodus and, and you can read about where Moses went up into Mount Sinai. All right. And, and this is where when Moses went up into Mount Sinai and he received the, the stone tablets from the Lord. Right. Uh, the 15th verse out of the 24th chapter of the book of Exodus tells us that Mount Sinai was clover, uh, covered by a cloud. And we are specifically told in the 16th verse that the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai. And again, that's from the book of Exodus in the 24th chapter. All right. So Moses, scripture tells us, went on into the midst of the cloud and the Lord spoke to him out of the midst of the cloud or from the midst of the cloud. Which again, sounds very familiar to what we just read from Mark's gospel, right? Again, in Mark's gospel, we have Jesus, we have Elijah, we have Moses, and then we have Peter, we have James and John. They are present there at the transfiguration of Jesus. And during the transfiguration of Jesus, the the cloud of glory, it, it overshadowed, it overcome the five that were present there. And then the father spoke out of the midst of the cloud. OK, so again, let us note here that in this picture of the kingdom of God, we have five that are present. All right. We have Moses present. We have Elijah present. The presence of Moses is representative of the law. All right. The presence of Elijah is representative of the prophets. We have the law and we have the prophets present. And then again, we have the only begotten son. We have Jesus Christ present as well. Okay. And so Jesus, we have to remember, he said that he didn't come to destroy. Jesus said that he came to fulfill. When, when the people asked Jesus, what is the greatest of the commandments? Jesus said to the people that they were to love the Lord, their God, with all of their heart. Then he said that they are to love their neighbor as they love themselves. He said, on both these commandments stand the prophets and the law. Jesus, he came to fulfill the law and he came to fulfill the, the, the prophecies of all of the prophets that had pointed to him. So, let us understand that the transfiguration itself, again, is representative of the fulfillment of Christ in that we have the law present. We have the prophets present. But not only do we have the law and the prophets present, but again, we have Peter, James and John present there. And again, we have Jesus, of course, present there as well. Jesus is representative of God's grace. Let us remember. God loved the world that he gave the world his only begotten son. God is love is what John said in his first epistle. Christ is God's grace. It is God's love given to us. All right. 
Grace, again, is God's unmerited love. We didn't deserve Jesus Christ. The world didn't deserve Jesus Christ, but the Lord, the Lord loved the world and he gave the world Jesus Christ. And again, Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophets. He is the fulfillment of the law as well. And now I want you to remember this as well. When we're talking about the kingdom of God, who else is going to be there? All right. We we see that those who were of faith and lived by the law or tried to live by the law and those who were of faith during the years of the prophets, they are going to be there. That's represented to us in Moses and Elijah. So who do James, John and Peter represent? They represent us. OK, in the 10th chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse. Christ said that he came not only to save the flock of Israel, but those who are of another fold of his. Who's of the other fold? The other fold that Jesus spoke of in the 10th chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse are the Gentiles. So whether you are Jew or Gentile, you have a right to inherit the kingdom of God if you genuinely believe in the only begotten son of God. If you accept the grace of God and you live under his grace, you will inherit the kingdom of God. Again, Jesus said that God loved the world, not just one group of people. He loved the world, which is representative again of all nations of people. So the disciples, yes, they are representative of the Jews, but the message of the disciples, the apostles, it went out to the rest of the world. And because that message went out to the rest of the world, the rest of the world had an opportunity, has an opportunity still to this day to inherit the kingdom of God. OK, so the disciples, I would say, being here at the transfiguration are representative of the new covenant that, that the Lord made with the world. The new covenant that the Lord made with the world is given by Jesus Christ. Every first Sunday when I stand and, and I do communion at church, I take the cup and I tell everyone exactly what Jesus said to the disciples at the last supper. He said that the cup is representative of a new covenant, which was shed by his, uh, which is representative, I should say, uh, of his shed blood, which is shed for the many, shed for the remission of all sins. All of us who believe in Christ, we are covered by the blood of Jesus. And because we have believed and have faith in him, we will inherit the kingdom of God. So at the transfiguration of Jesus, we have total fulfillment of what God promised. Those who are under the law are present. Those who lived under the prophets, they are present. Those who live under grace, they are present there as well. So again, the transfiguration, we have this beautiful, we have this very beautiful picture of the kingdom of God here. Okay. And again, I want you to understand today that Peter, James and John, that they were witnesses of the kingdom of God there in the flesh. OK, up on the mountain. And again, as Peter said uh, in his letter, the second letter, Peter, he said that they were not following devised fables. They were not uh, making up uh, myths legends, right? They weren't making up fantasy. Uh, they were living eyewitnesses of the truth, of the majesty of Christ. Not only the majesty of Christ, but the majesty of the Lord's heavenly kingdom. All right. So now Jesus's majesty here at the transfiguration, it is again, very significant, very important to us. Something that we ought to focus in on. I want to focus in on the change here. Okay. Jesus changing from how he would normally look over into this image where he is shining, his face shined, his clothes, uh, they changed. And we're told again, uh, that they were white, not just any kind of white, they were white as snow. 
Uh, and again, in Luke's gospel, Luke he, Luke, he wrote that his clothes were glistening, that they were sparkling. Uh, so I want to take a look at this because, again, I believe that uh, this picture that we have of Jesus at the transfiguration, uh, it shows us mankind's past, but most importantly, it shows us our future as well. So when I say that we are taking a look at mankind's past, I am talking about the way in which we were created in. In the first chapter of Genesis and in the 26th verse, a verse that I have referenced a lot this year, we will recall that God created mankind in his image and in his likeness. When God created us, mankind was holy, we were righteous, we were perfect. So the transfiguration of Jesus, I want you to understand that, again, it's not Jesus in his true form. It's not God in his true form. We we are seeing an image of what Jesus would essentially be like uh, in his post-resurrected body. And again, we referenced the book of Revelation earlier. We, we get an image of that. We have to understand that Jesus, he uh, transfigured himself from being, you know, his his natural state in the flesh. So he was still he was still flesh and blood at this moment in time is what I'm trying to say there. Uh, so we, we essentially see uh, Jesus in the the perfection of humanity. We, we see him. Uh, in humanity uh, as, as, as a being, right, in, 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 in his perfect form. The, the way in which we were designed in, that we were created in, we, again, mankind, we were created in the image and in the likeness of God. We, we saw, again, Jesus standing and appearing in glory, Right. Mankind, you, you've you probably heard me say this before, and I've said this in teaching and in preaching, that when God created us, we had a glow about ourselves. And, and when I say that we had a glow about ourselves, I mean, again, that we had glory. We were holy and, and that we were righteous. Adam and Eve in the garden, they had a glow about themselves. Because again, they were perfect. They were holy and, and they were righteous. God did not create us to be sinners. We became sinners, yes, but God didn't create us in the image of sin. He created us in the image of perfection. Okay, so when, when you think about Adam and Eve in the garden, they didn't have to toil in the garden. Uh, they were not heavy burdened in the garden, right? Uh, the, the only thing Adam and Eve had to do was not to eat from the tree that was in the midst of the garden. They didn't have, they, they were commanded not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So they live what we would say were glorified lives, right? They, they were in glorified bodies. Okay. They were clothed in glory. You know, they, they didn't thirst for anything. They didn't hunger for anything. They didn't have to work for anything. The only thing that we see in scripture that they were commanded to do was essentially not to eat from the tree. They were placed in the garden to, to tend to the garden. Now, something that people often question, something that people often ask is that why did Adam and Eve not see that they were naked uh, prior to them uh be disobedient, disobeying uh, the Lord in the garden. Now, it's a question that I've heard quite a bit, and, and I have an answer to that question. And I've answered this question a lot uh, in my life. The reason why Adam and Eve did not see that they were naked in the garden is because, again, they were clothed. They were clothed in glory. And so because they were clothed in glory, they went unaware to their nakedness. They didn't know of it, right? It was not until they lost their glory. And again, they lost their glory because they disobeyed the Lord in the garden. They sinned in the garden. 
when when they sinned, when they disobeyed in the garden, they lost their clothes. They lost being clothed in glory. And they saw, they realized, they were then aware that they were not dressed. They realized they became aware of their nakedness. Now, something that I often point out about their nakedness in the garden is they were not only naked physically, as we would think of, but they were also naked spiritually as well, which made them vulnerable. Okay, they they were not only vulnerable to things of nature in our world, right? They were vulnerable to all that goes on around us spiritually. Okay, and and, and this is going to be something that I focus on in, in my sermon this upcoming week is is spiritual warfare. All right, all of us are vulnerable to the spiritual warfare that is going on today, and that's because again, none of us are are yet clothed in, in glory. Okay. So without, without, without being clothed in, in glory, uh, we find that Adam and Eve were vulnerable to now death. Death was not something that the Lord uh, intended for mankind, because again, the Lord desired to dwell with mankind for, for all of eternity. But man became vulnerable to death. We became vulnerable to sickness uh, because uh, we lost our glory in the garden. But again, we became vulnerable to all that uh, the devil tries to throw at us, right? We became vulnerable uh, to our spiritual environment as well, all right? So something that I do want to note here and something that I note in the commentary as well is by taking a look at our past glory, And by taking a look at the transfiguration of Jesus, we can see our future. Okay, our future is what Adam and Eve once had. Right. We we know that to be the case because, again, the Lord has reconciled all things unto himself. The reason that God sent the world his only begotten son was to win mankind back from sin. God has never given up the desire nor the plan to dwell with us for all of eternity. Okay, so so the transfiguration of Jesus, we we, again, we see this image of himself in his post resurrected body. But at the same time, we see an image of ourselves in our post resurrected body. Because again, all of us one day are going to be resurrected. We will die a physical death in in this world that we live in. Okay. But that is not our end. Okay. All of those who have genuinely believed in the Lord, we will be called from the graves. We will be resurrected from the grave. All right. And we will be called up unto glory, to where we will be with Christ forever. So this is a thought that Paul, he spoke about to the Corinthians in his first letter uh, to the Corinthians. If you uh, take a look at the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the 35th through the 49th verse, you will see where Paul, he speaks about a glorious body. He speaks about uh, the resurrected body of all of those that genuinely believed in the Lord. Again, how we are one day going to be called from the grave. Now, if we specifically, uh, there's a lot of scripture here to look at, but let me, I want you to look at the, the 42nd verse through the 44th verse specifically there. Uh, he speaks about the resurrection of the dead there in the 42nd, the 43rd, the 44th verse. Paul said, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body, that's talking about our body as it is now. He said, the body is sown in corruption. Okay, our body, we live again in a world of sin. We live in the midst of wickedness. All right. He said, the body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Which again, all of us, we are going to physically die. 
Okay. Even those who are living uh, when Jesus come and he raptures the church out of the world, they're going to shed the physical body. The physical body must die. And from the physical body will raise up a body that is incorruptible. So again, he said the body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. And in the 43rd verse, Paul said it is sown in dishonor. Again, we live in a world of sin. But then he said the body, it is raised in glory. He said it is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. So Paul is he's going back and forth between our body as it is now compared to our glorified body. OK, which we have seen again, an image of through the transfiguration of Jesus. He then says there in the 44th verse, he said it is sown a natural body. Talking about our physical body. And then he said it is raised a spiritual body. Which draws a big difference between the post-resurrected body of Christ and the the image of that post-resurrected body that we see at the during the transfiguration of Jesus. Like I said, the transfiguration of Jesus was an image of the future because he's still flesh and blood. He just transfigured himself to, to show us the image, to show Peter, James, and John the image of the future. And again, we, we can see where it was a uh, a reflection, I guess you could say, of mankind's past. That's what Adam and Eve once looked like as well. And so the post-resurrected body of Christ was not necessarily one that was of flesh and blood any longer. He still had the same appearance, which we clearly can see. Okay, and we'll, we'll get more into that in a moment. But he was raised a spiritual body, and that will be the case for all of us as well. We're going to be raised in power, and it's going to be a body of glory and honor. It is going to be incorruptible, is what we see Paul say there to the Corinthians. Now, as we continue on looking here, when we continue looking at the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and if you take a look here at the 51st, the 52nd, the 53rd verse, we'll see where Paul, he wrote about our spiritual transformation. And he said that this transformation that all of us will undergo to, to put on our perfect and our glorified bodies, Paul said that it would happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And again, he said that the corruptible, that is again, our flesh will be raised incorruptible and Paul said that it will be raised immortal. Okay. Our body as it is now, it is mortal. You cut us, we bleed, right? It can die and it will die. But the perfect and the glorified body, okay, our spiritual body, okay, it will not, if you, you cut it, which you won't be able to do, it's not going to bleed, right? Okay, it's impossible for it to bleed. It is impossible. It will be impossible for us to die. All right. Again, if you think back to Jesus teaching Nicodemus in the third chapter of John's gospel, Jesus said that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. All right. He said that only the spiritual can. Those that have believed, right? Those, they will be able to inherit uh, the kingdom of God. Now to the Philippians in the third chapter of Philippians, just a cross reference here in the 20th and the 21st verse, you'll see that Paul, he wrote about our citizenship. He said that our citizenship is in heaven. You know, we think that our citizenship is in the world, but the world is just a temporary home for us. We won't be here forever. Our home is in heaven. All right. So he said that our citizenship is in heaven and that we wait for Christ who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed, that it may be changed to Jesus's glorified body, which, again, we have seen the image of during the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. OK, so for us to, to fully 
see what our bodies will be like uh, in, in, in the spiritual form. We, we must move away from the transfiguration of Jesus to looking at Jesus' true glorified body after his resurrection. So we must look at the post-resurrected body of Christ so that we can get a true picture of what our glorified body uh, will be like. So let us take a look here now at the post-resurrected body of Christ so that we can see uh, the future of of us, okay, the future of all of those that genuinely believe when we put on our perfect and our glorified bodies. So in the 20th chapter of John's gospel, we we see Jesus Christ in his post-resurrected body. Uh, Thomas, he, he had doubted that the disciples, uh, they that they had seen Jesus. He doubted the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, in the 27th verse, we, we see Jesus, he appears to Thomas. And what we notice about the post-resurrected body of Christ, and I, I just mentioned this, is that by the outward appearance, he still looked the same. Okay, Thomas was in the, the other disciples, at least in that moment, they were able to recognize Jesus. Something funny does happen in scripture where uh, many people seem to struggle to recognize Jesus uh, in his post-resurrected body. But here in this moment, we, we, we can see where uh, Thomas was able to recognize Jesus, that uh, Jesus in his post-resurrected body, he still looked the same. He still had the same body. In fact, uh, he told Thomas uh, to look at the places where he had physically been nailed to the cross. And then he even pointed to his side where he had been punctured in the side while he was on the cross. Uh, that w When Jesus was punctured in his side, it was punctured after he had actually died. Okay, the Romans they they did that when when someone hung on the cross after they died. They was it was just a means to see if they were actually still alive. They will they will poke a hole into their side uh, to see if they were were still alive. And of course Jesus he was dead, but it was still there. Okay, so Thomas Jesus told him fill in fill in the holes where where I was nailed where I was nailed into the cross and take a look at the side where where I was punctured through as well. Okay. So it was the same body, okay, by the outward appearance at least, but we know again that it was was completely different. Which again, some of us would, would wonder, some of us would ask, well, does that mean that uh when we are resurrected from the grave, are we going to have the same bodies? Are we going to have the same wounds? Are we going to have the same scars? Are we going to have the same limitations that we've had in in our physical bodies that we had in our physical bodies, are we going to have those same limitations in our resurrected body? As far as appearances go, I'm not, I can't say for certain, uh, are we going to, that we're going to have the same wounds and that we're going to have the same scars. I, I can't say that for certain. I don't know if I'm going to have the same scar from where surgery was performed on me, uh, during my transplant. Okay. I don't know if that scar is going to be there. Maybe it will be there. I don't know. OK, but as far as limitations go, we're certainly not going to have the same disabilities. We're certainly not going to have the same limitations that we have in our physical bodies. And the reason why I can say that again is because what we've already saw, what we've seen Paul say, our bodies are going to be raised incorruptible. We're not going to be raised in, with, with our physical bodies to to where we are flesh and blood and bones. We're not going to we're going to be raised spiritual bodies. So when we take a look at Jesus's appearances post-resurrection, all right, again, we're, we're seeing him in his perfect and we're seeing him in his glorified bodies. And even as we saw Paul say, the resurrected body, okay, again, it's not going to be raised flesh and blood. And again, as Jesus said in the third chapter of John's gospel, the fifth and the sixth verse, all right, we, we cannot be raised flesh and blood because we would not be uh, able to inherit the kingdom of God. The whole purpose behind our resurrection is to raise us up in these perfect bodies so that we can inherit the kingdom of God. In Jesus's resurrected body, okay, 
Something that I want to point out that scripture shows us is that his personality, it did not change. A lot of us wonder how we are going to be uh, in heaven. Your personality, I don't believe, is is going to change. In fact, if there is a change, I, w- I would suggest that that change is that you're going to be happy. And the reason why you're going to be happy is because those aches and those pains, those worries and those burdens and the stress there that we had to deal with, all the fears that we had to deal with, those things are going to be put away from us. We're not going to be dealing with those things anymore. So the grumpy Christian is not going to be grumpy anymore. The 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 one who's pessimistic isn't going to be pessimistic uh, anymore. Okay, but but we find that Jesus, his personality, his wit. Okay, yeah, and dare I say his sarcasm. Uh, because Jesus could be quite uh, witty, he could be quite sarcastic as well. Uh, it, it it still remained, and, and and I believe that we can see it uh, when we take a look at the breakfast that Jesus had with the uh, the disciples uh, by the Sea of Galilee. You can find that in the twenty first chapter of John's Gospel. Uh, if you if you take a look at that passage of scripture, uh, you will see that in Jesus's glorified body. That, that Jesus was still able to stand and he was still able to move around as he was accustomed to doing uh, in in his physical body as well. Uh, also, something that I want to point out as well, that in his post-resurrected body, that Jesus, he even ate. And this is something that, you know, we wouldn't really think of. But when 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 Jesus appeared, uh, to to his disciples, they they thought that he was a ghost, and to prove that he was not a ghost, uh, Jesus he he ate fish. He asked them to bring him some fish. He asked them to bring him something to eat. Uh, you can see this uh, shared in the twenty fourth chapter of Luke's gospel in the fortieth through the forty third verse. In in those verses, you'll see where he ate fish and he ate a honeycomb as well to prove that he wasn't a ghost. All right, that's something that that we wouldn't necessarily think of because again, we wouldn't think that we would need to eat in our post-resurrected body, which in fact we wouldn't need to eat. Okay, again, if you think about, and I mentioned this earlier, if you think about Adam and Eve in the garden, they had the same body that we are going to have. Okay, they had the glorified body. They had the uh, us, us humans in perfection. They had that body. Adam and Eve. Their 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 glorified body did not require them to eat anything. They didn't they didn't hunger, they didn't thirst, they didn't starve for anything. But we know that they had the ability to eat because God had commanded them not to eat from the tree in the midst of the garden. But they could eat from any other tree. So so Adam and Eve, when they ate in the garden, they simply ate for pleasure, not because their body required it. So in scripture, you'll find where where the Lord speaks of a great wedding feast and how many are invited to the wedding. And the wedding that is going to take place is going to be between Jesus and his bride. The bride is the church who is being made ready for the wedding while we are in the world. And the church is filled with all of those that genuinely believe in Christ, not all of those that that go to church out of religion. Okay. So there's going to be a feast. And I believe that all of us are going to sit down and we're going to eat one day with the Lord, not because our bodies will require us to eat, but because we will do it out of pleasure. All right. So I believe that's something else that, that is going to happen that, that, that in our spiritual bodies, I want to show you that we will be able to move around as we are accustomed to moving around. So if we need to stand up in our spiritual bodies, we'll be able to do that. If we need to walk around, uh, we'll be able to do that. There's that old song about how we will sing and how we'll shout and how we'll jump and walk all over God's heaven. We will be able to do that. I I genuinely do believe that uh, we will be able to do that as well. Uh, Again, being able to walk all over God's heaven, being able to walk. Uh, is shown to us in Jesus's post-resurrected body on the road to Emmaus. All right. If you look at, again, at the 24th chapter of Luke's gospel and you look at 
the 13th through the 27th verse, you'll see where Jesus, he walked with two on the road to Emmaus, even though they did not recognize that it was him. They didn't recognize it was him until he took bread. He was able to hold bread, right? Uh, and he was able to break it, all right? He was able to sit down with them. And 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 the two, they said, oh, was that him? Was, was, that, was that Christ? So again, all right, we will be able to, I believe, be able to interact with one another in the Lord's heavenly kingdom. Okay. Um, we're, we're again, not going to have any disabilities. We're not going to have any limitations, uh, in, in our, in our resurrected bodies. Okay. We, we're going to be raised perfect. Okay. As the Lord intended us to be, we're going to be holy. We're going to be righteous. We are going to dwell eternally. We're going to live forever. It's not going to be possible for us to get sick. We're not going to have any aches. We're not going to have any pains. Okay. Not only that, uh, we're going to have a glow about us. We're going to have a sparkle about us, which again is confirmed for us in the book of Revelation. Because when the bride appears in the book of Revelation, we are a gem. We are a gem in heaven. Okay. And the citizens of heaven will admire our beauty. All right. So that is what we see. All of what we take in from the transfiguration of Jesus. Do you see why I say that we shouldn't overlook the transfiguration of Jesus? Because again, there is so much wonderful news for all of us that genuinely believe. There's so much inspiration. There's so much hope for us, hope for us to live by. You know, I there, there are things in scripture when we talk about our heavenly rewards. I, I live today to receive my crown. I, I, I want my reward. But again, I also want that spiritual body. I, I want, I'm living today, not for the flesh. I'm, I'm living to be able to, to, to be clothed in glory. I'm done with this flesh of mine. Okay. I, I had, I have gone through and still have a disability to, to where my kidneys failed me. I know, I know about the body being able to kill itself, being able to die. Okay. And that's not something that I want to go through. I want to live eternally. Okay. And, and I, and I don't want to live eternally through the flesh and blood. I want to put on my glorified body. So I am thankful one day that, yes, even though I have a, a kidney transplant for which I am thankful for, I will be happy the day that I don't have to rely on a heart beating in my chest, right? That I don't have to be dependent on organs in this body of mine, that, that these things are going to pass away, pass away from me. And I'm going to put on my incorruptible body to where I'm able to, to dwell in God's heavenly kingdom and be able to travel, okay, throughout God's wonderful heaven, the new heaven that he's making for, for all of us, okay? All right, so yeah, I hope that you enjoyed this study. I'm going to do more studies like this. I have a whole season of studies that I'm going to have to record and that I'm going to share with all of you who may listen to uh, the podcast feed, all of you who may listen uh, by going to the website. And then for all of you who watch the videos on YouTube, you'll be able to watch. And I'm using air quotes. You can't see me because I'm not recording. I'm not videoing myself, but you'll be able to hear me uh, on YouTube as well. So I hope that all of you enjoy these studies. And, and yes, they are longer. They are intended to be longer because we are taking a deep dive into scripture for more knowledge so that we can edify ourselves so that we can continue to grow in our wisdom and in our faith in the Lord. Okay. All right. So that is our study for this week. I'm going to share another study with you. Not next week. It'll be the week after next week. Okay. So again, I hope that all you continue about in grace and in love. That is our calling as a child of God to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And again, let us continue to keep one another lifted up in prayers. And I'll do the same. I lift all of you up in my prayers. And I pray that the Lord continues to keep and to bless all of you.